So in this lecture, uh, in the Waking Up to Wellness course, I'm going to talk about the 10 toxic truths. And there's just a warning before you listen to this lecture, uh, that you, once you know this information, you can't unknow it. And it can be really depressing, because this lecture will discuss some of the um, sort of factual basis of toxicity and its implications for all life on Earth. But as I was describing in our first lecture, that it's really important to understand the negative, but act f towards the positive. So, you know, once you understand sort of the negativity and the toxicity that's surrounding us, inside us, and dominating our lives, then that gives you a, a really good basis and a platform for acting. And uh, hopefully, uh, rather than depress you, this will actually inspire you to have positive actions in your life. So when thinking about chronic disease and lifestyle, it was estimated that over 60% of all deaths on planet Earth are caused by lifestyle-related chronic disease. So it's not war, it's not infections, it's not malnutrition, etc. that causes most deaths, it's our lifestyles. And the main modifiable risk factors for these diseases are physical inactivity, unhealthy diet, sugar, salt, fat, alcohol and tobacco, which are all toxic substances that we voluntarily take in, and a whole range of environmental toxicants, which are toxic substances that we involuntarily get exposed to. And that's what I'm gonna focus on in this uh, current presentation. Now, as of 2014, it was estimated that cancer became the biggest killer on planet Earth. And that's true in Australia, the US, and all around the world. And that reason for this is because there's more carcinogens. Uh, it's not a genetic change. This is the world becoming more toxic and we're, we're living longer and we have more time to develop cancer. And cancer prevention plays a critical role in fighting this, what's called a tidal wave of cancer. And that means avoiding smoking, infections, obesity, alcohol, radiation, air pollution, and toxic chemicals, which are all the major sources of preventable cancers. So another important issue when considering toxicity is looking at our healthy ecosystems. And this really is determined by the biomes, which is the, the collection, the ecosystem of microbial activity, which includes viruses, bacteria, fungi, archaea, um, different um, spores and parasites, and mites, etc., that live in us, on us, and around us. And at the moment, these uh, biomes, which are in our bathing water, in our bowels, in our breath, on our bodies, and in our buildings, are under attack. We've really waged war on life since the start of the 20th century and where we started putting chlorine in our bathing water we use um, and that uh, that shifts the bacterial load in bathing water towards more um, pathogenic bacteria um, interestingly enough and towards bacteria with more uh, antibiotic resistance so even though it does kill some bacteria it doesn't kill all it doesn't kill certain viruses uh, so it's great for public health issues but we really wage war on our you know the, our bathing biomes, and also that affects the um, biome in our bowels, our microbiome um, in our gut, which is affected by chlorine, but also by antibiotics and pesticides, which affect bacteria. So things like glyphosate, which isn't doesn't affect human cells, but it actually affects bacterial cells. But now we know that those bacteria in our gut are super important for our health, our digestion, our moods, our appetites and cravings, um, are all uh, have a big impact on our gut bacteria. There's also a biome in our breath, and every time we breathe out, we actually breathe out a whole range of viruses and bacteria that then get shared. That's not necessarily a bad thing, because um, the commensal bacteria having a healthy ecosystem is really good for us. And we now know that forest bathing, when you go out into nature, you actually breathe in genetic material from the trees and the plants and the soil, and that has a positive effect on our health. So. Um, yeah, it's really great to find places where you can, there's more you know, trees than cars and just breathe and be there. Um, there's also a whole range of bacteria and viruses that are always living in our bodies. Yet they're under attack from chlorine that we wash in and antibacterial wipes and hand sanitizers, etc. And then in our buildings, and we'll talk quite a bit about that in, in week five, uh, 
that our buildings actually need to have a healthy ecosystem but when we try and disinfect everything and when there's standing water and mold and bacteria have this um, biotoxin battle over territory uh, that actually in adversely impacts our health so our health is not just about us it's about the whole ecosystem that we're living in and very often toxic chemicals can actually affect at that ecosystem which also affects us and when looking at toxicants and chronic disease very often it's, it's the elephant in the room we don't often consider the impact of environmental chemicals and uh, other toxic agents um, on chronic disease yet we've seen the, the um, trajectory of human illness with a global epidemic now of obesity and diabetes and um, neurodevelopmental disorders such as ADHD um, depression and cancers and this is no doubt uh, uh, impacted on by the, the incredible rise of toxic agents that we're now exposed to but it really is the elephant in the room because doctors don't have a test to, to understand toxicity and it's very often not considered so while we're you know, sitting around the table you know talking about you know, which drugs for which effect and how do we affect symptoms and how do we um, impact on chronic disease unless we talk about toxicity we're really missing the point So what makes something poison? Um, is it just the dose? So about 500 years ago, Paracelsus, a famous alchemist, physician, philosopher, came up and said the dose makes the poison. And he said the poison isn't everything and no thing is without poison. The dosage makes it either a poison or a remedy. And this was quite revolutionary 500 years ago in terms of medical science. However, now we know it's not just the dose that makes a poison. There are five factors that determine toxicity. The first one is the type of toxic agent it is. Is it you know, heavy metal? Is it a persistent pollutant? Is it an electromagnetic radiation exposure? So the type of toxic agent um, has an impact. Then it is the dose. And um, you know, the dose does have an impact on whether something's going to be poison or not. Then it's also the timing of when you're exposed. So if you're a, um, an infant or an elderly person, you might you'll respond, or you will respond very differently than if you're an adult. And also, if you're exposed in particular times of the day or a circadian cycle um, during the month or even the season can have an impact on toxicity. And it's also the mixture of chemicals. And we know that mixtures are much more toxic than individual chemicals alone. So the combination of chemicals you're exposed to has effect um, on toxicity. And finally, luck has a major impact. And that is the luck of the genetics that you've inherited from your parents and the luck of where you live and the geography and the proximity to uh, toxic outlets and industry and from um, proximity to industrial accidents so the type the dose the timing the mixture and the luck you know i love putting things into five as you know these are the five factors that determine toxicity and we're thinking about the toxic toxicity equation you know how do you determine that? Well, it's not rocket science. So your accumulated toxicity is determined by the toxicity in minus the toxicity out. And the toxicity in, and you know, I'll put things into fives, um, come, the toxicity comes in through our water, our food, our air, from radiation, and from products, the things we buy and make, make our buildings out of. And toxicity comes out through the five Bs, our bladder, our bowel, our breath, our body, and our brain. So it's not rocket science you want to reduce the toxicity coming in and you want to increase the toxicity going out and that will reduce your body burden but we all have a toxic load we all have a body burden of toxicity and trying to determine how big your toxic load is um, can actually be problematic because it's very hard to measure these things and often we think there's one factor you know, is it the virus or is it um, an allergen that causes our disease and that's just really the straw that's breaking our back and making us symptomatic when we realize that we're all you know, burdened by this toxic load that you know, is actually increasing as, as we age. And then you know, when that last straw comes and, and breaks our back or causes a disease, that's the one we focus on. But 
a really good strategy is to try and reduce your toxic load as um, little as possible. And that moves us up that wellness illness vortex. Remember, as you go up the vortex, you get wider and you get more, a greater ability to cope with stress. Well, that toxic load pushes you down. It's actually weighting you down and pushing you down that wellness illness vortex towards illness. So the more you can relieve your toxic load, the more you can float up that wellness illness vortex towards wellness and cope with a whole range of, of different issues and stressors that life brings to you because you're not burdened by this um, toxicity that limits your ability to cope. So now to the 10 toxic truths. And this is just a, a summary. I'm going to go through them quickly and then we're going to go through them a little bit more in depth. But I want to give you a pre preemption of what I'm going to talk about. So these are the 10 toxic truths. There is an article you can read about it. But um, it is everyone's affected and the full extent is unknown. But tiny doses have big effects and persistence leads to biomagnification up the food chain. We know that windows of development are critical and the effects are epigenetic and transgenerational. That chemical cocktails are synergistic, that bioaccumulation occurs over the lifespan, and that exposure is unequal, unjust, and accidents happen, and that risk is unequal, unjust, and it's greater the young. So I'm going to go into these points in a little bit more depth, and sorry that this is depressing, but it's really important that you understand this to, to really help you act um, from the positives. So toxic truth number one, toxicants are everywhere, and we are all affected. POPs, which stands for Persistent Organic Pollutants, are found in everyone and everywhere on the planet. They're in our food, our soil, our air, our water, and our homes. And humans and wildlife around the world carry these persistent organic pollutants in their bodies at or near levels that can cause injury. And toxic chemicals are found in all human tissue, including um, umbilical cord blood and breast milk. And very often indoor environments are more contaminated than outdoor environments. So how does toxicity get everywhere on earth? Well, there's a, uh, we also know that air pollution is actually more deadly than the road toll. So in Australia, it was estimated that um, death from air pollution exceeds death from the road toll and costs about $5.8 billion. And that this air pollution actually boosts the potency of airborne allergens, so it makes you know, other allergens and pollen more allergenic um, because of the pollution that sticks to the allergens. And since we've had GPS and um, there's been epidemiological studies on location, they know that proximity to traffic, so your, your um, proximity to high traffic areas is a major risk factor for heart and lung disease, breast cancer, autism, and poor cognitive function in children. So they do that just by for your home address and your incidence of these diseases. So you don't spend all your time at home, but how close your home is to major traffic um, areas will be a big impact on your risk of chronic disease. And with the traffic, it's, it's more dangerous to be closer to an intersection where cars are, and especially trucks are stopping and starting because um, diesel exhaust is sort of worse than petrol exhaust. But when trucks start up after stopping, that's when they when they're accelerating. That's when they emit the most emissions. So, yeah, um, traffic um, pollution is a major major factor, and we're all affected by that. So, toxic truth number two: the full extent is unknown. Now, the toxicants are often invisible, and their effects are latent. May take many years to actually have an adverse effect. And there are more than a hundred and forty thousand toxic chemicals that we produce commercially and more than 3,000 of those are in, produced in high volume which means they're, they're making many many millions of tons every year and that there's at least 1,500 new commercial chemicals released every year and most of these are not tested for toxicity. We also know that many toxic chemicals are produced inadvertently by accident anytime we produce um, uh, or we burn fossil fuels. So when you burn fossil fuels, you get soot and smoke, and there's a whole range of chemicals in that soot and smoke that we really don't know what they are, but we do know that they're toxic, and they have no use, and they're not yet named, but they have a toxic impact on us. So not only are most chemicals not tested for toxicity, uh, we don't actually measure them in humans, or very rarely do we measure them in humans. So human biomonitoring studies are limited. 
So very few toxic chemicals are routinely tested for. And the world's most comprehensive biomonitoring study, which is done in the US, um, the NHANE study, um, and they've actually stopped doing it now. I don't know when the next one's going to come out. But they only monitored 212 chemicals out of 140,000 that we produce and the many more that we don't produce that are, you know, that are inadvertently made. But when they looked at those chemicals, there were chemicals like phthalates, um, which, which is a type of petrochemical made to make plastics um, soft and also to prolong fragrances, um, were found in more than 90% of the population. Yet doctors don't have any way to assess this toxic load um, and we don't use these measures clinically because um, very often it's very expensive and very difficult to measure individual chemicals. We don't know which chemicals to measure. So there's no blood test or hair test or, or, or um, clinical test that you can do just to assess your exposure to these chemicals. So we, we're really flying blind um, in a lot of cases because um, we, just, we just don't have the tools to measure these in our bodies. So yeah. Everyone's affected and the full extent is unknown. Toxic truth number three, tiny doses can have big effects. Now it used to be thought you know, traditionally that there was a linear dose response curve. And that means small dose, small effect, big dose, big effect. And that's called a monotonic dose response curve. And that's the basis for regulation of public safety limits. Because they assume below a certain effect there's but below a certain dose, there's no effect, so below that, it's safe. Well, that's actually sadly not true, because dose responses can be non-monotonic, which means you have a um, high dose, high effect, or maybe high dose, um, small effect, middle dose, high effect, and low dose, low effect, or you might have high dose, high effect, middle dose, low effect, and tiny dose, high effect. And this has been well documented in um, one classic case is looking at in utero exposure of diethyl still bestrol um, where they fit where they exposed uh, pregnant rats to diethyl still bestrol at a hundred parts per billion and the pups the rat pups that were born were really scrawny at um, and became quite scrawny adult mice yet if they exposed the mother to one part per billion the pups that were born grew into these grotesquely obese mice so the difference between 100 parts per billion and one part per billion, actually, they both had um, quite big effects, but different effects. But so even at the very, very low dose, they actually had a really dramatic effect. And this is a, a problem because it means that, um, especially when you have uh, chemicals that affect your endocrine system, that affects the regulation of your body. And you only need a small change in the regulation of things to have a big clinical effect. Um, the effect of endocrine disrupting chemicals was described um, in the 1990s in this book, Our Stolen Future, by Theo Colburn and Pete Myers. And they examined uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals, and they said that currently used chemicals can impair reproduction, behaviour, intellectual capacity, and the ability to resist disease in current and future generations. And, you know, they said that our worldwide exposure to endocrine disruption has thrust everyone into a large-scale, unplanned, unintended experiment with health, the outcome of which may not be known for generations. Well, that was in the mid-1990s, so in that generation later, we're understanding that exposure, and it's devastating. The trajectory of human disease um, is being severely affected by this endocrine disruption. The extent of endocrine disrupting chemicals and their impact uh, was uh, the subject of the state of the science report from the World Health Organization and the United Nations Environmental Program in 2012. So this report found that endocrine disrupting chemicals found in, our, in pesticides, electronics, personal care products, cosmetics and food are at least partly to blame for the global increase in obesity, birth deformities, cancers, psychiatric disease, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and other neurodevelopmental problems in children. And this report actually said that the current findings may be the tip of the iceberg. So that's you know, it's a really devastating um, situation where very tiny doses of these endocrine disrupting chemicals can have major effects. And really, this, the health of the, of the global population 
Uh, it's not just humans, but all wildlife has been affected by this. So toxic truth number four is that persistence leads to biomagnification. So persistent organic pollutants, POPs, um, uh, chemicals that last for decades in the environment, and very often they're fat soluble. And these are things such as DDT and PCBs, and they can persist for years, as I say, decades. And they're stored in fatty tissue and they biomagnify up the food chain so that they can be 10 million times higher at the top of the food chain than the bottom of the food chain. And that's because they'll, the phytoplankton will absorb the, um, you know, these chemicals. Or remember that the chemicals will actually leach, um, you know, um, latch onto these uh, small micro beads of plastic and the, phyto the phytoplankton can absorb the chemicals and then the zooplankton eat the phytoplankton and concentrate them and then the little shrimp eat the zooplankton and concentrate them and then the little fish eat the shrimp and concentrate them and then the bigger fish eat the little fish and as you got the food chain you get this concentration of toxicity and that's actually one reason why it's good to be vegetarian and eat at the bottom of the food chain because your toxic exposure will be less So in 2004, the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants came up with called the, what they called the Deadly Dozen. And these um, persistent organic pollutants, which was a, was a dirt, was sort of the Dirty Dozen. So this Dirty Dozen chemicals all had long-range environmental transport, which means they were um, traveling around the whole planet. They all persisted in the environment for, for decades. They accumulated up the food chain and they were toxic, directly toxic to humans and the environment and wildlife. And um, a large majority of these toxic um, chemicals, the, the dirty dozen, are pesticides, or they were the organochlorine pesticides. And since then they've been replaced by the organophosphate pesticides, but they're still persistent in the environment. And even though a lot of these are, are now banned from use, um, you know, the, the legacy, these are legacy chemicals, which we're all impacted by. I said how leg legacy chemicals, these persistent organic pollutants, increase up the food chain. Well, at the very top of the food chain is the human infant. Because, you know, humans eat animals and plants, but infants eat food from humans, breast milk. So um, as you go up the food chain, we're actually, you know, polluting the most vulnerable, um, which are our infants and the next generation. And all human breast milk samples that have been tested in the last few years from all over the world have been contaminated with these persistent organic pollutants and we know that um, breastfeeding is actually a good way to detoxify because generally fat is a very valuable biological resource so you don't generally want to excrete fat so when you store fat that that stores these toxic chemicals but one way you know you do excrete fat if you're a, a female is when you're breastfeeding because you want to give this high valuable resource to your infant. But sadly, that high valuable, um, high value resource can contain a high level of toxicity. And very often the, the, or the, the mother will detoxify into the first child, which has a higher toxic load than subsequent children. And if you have an older brother or sister, you need to give them thanks for taking the toxic hit for you because you, you've got, you've, you were exposed to cleaner breast milk because of, of um, that process. Yet, despite its toxicity and breast milk is um, contaminated, you know, there's no question about that, but still breast milk is the best possible food for human infants. Um, and the benefits of breastfeeding far exceed the risks from that toxicity. And certainly if you're you know, infant formula also has toxicity issues, and especially the water you're producing it from and where that's produced. So breast milk, breast is best for human infants, despite its toxicity. And it's an interesting uh, measure of toxicity. They've um, looked at whales and sea mammals. And certain sea mammals, when they wash up on the beach, their carcasses can be so laden with toxic chemicals that they have to be considered as or treated as toxic waste. And they've been using whales to monitor toxicity in the oceans, and apparently whales don't clean their ears. So, you know, the, over the 80 years or, or so lifespan of a whale, they have this buildup of wax in their ear canal, which gets laid on each year after year. So that wax 
is a fatty substance that has a historical record of the toxicity that that whale has been exposed to as it's traveled over the, the world's oceans. And what they found looking at this um, you know, earwax from uh, whales is that the whale gets a really big toxic hit when it's breastfeeding because whales are mammals and they breastfeed. So there's a big toxic load while the whale's breastfeeding and then they see that that toxicity has gradually increased over whales' lifespans as the oceans have become more and more toxic. So that gives you a historical record of toxicity in the oceans. And um, sadly, you know, it's really increasing dramatically. So toxic truth number five is that chemical cocktails are synergistic, which means exposure to a mixture of chemicals is far more harmful than exposure to individual chemicals. And that's true even when the level of each contaminant in the mixture causes no effect by itself. And when we look at the safety testing, if, if chemicals are actually tested for safety, chemical, um, safety testing, and very often they're not, but when they are, they're tested for one ke um, chemical at a time. We, never, we don't test for te um, safety of combinations of chemicals. So this is a, a, a real problem because it, it really means the testing that we're doing is not that relevant to the real world. When you look at the idea of chemical toxicity and mixture toxicity, um, the combination effects are certainly real. And there's a, a state-of-the-art report on mixture toxicity. And um, they actually describe what they call the something from nothing effect. And this is not like, you're not defining the first law of thermodynamics here, which, you know, everything is one and you can't add or subtract. But what they found is that when you've got two chemicals that by themselves do nothing, so they're below the the dose that has any effect, but if you add them together, they actually get an effect. So there's strong evidence that mixture effects may arise when several chemicals are combined at doses or concentrations around or below points of departure, and that's the zero effect level. So sadly, it's really hard to predict um, the toxicity when you can have this combination effect, which really isn't test tested for, and it makes it very, very complex. Yep, we do know a lot about um, mixture toxicity in terms of formulating toxic substances. And that mixture toxicity is used to advantage um, by chemical companies that want to make something more toxic. So, for example, Roundup um, is the uh, you know, pesticide that is used um, with the active ingredient glyphosate. So glyphosate is an active ingredient. And that's what's tested for when you look at the acceptable daily intake. Uh, however, when they formulate Roundup, they put in a lot of other so-called inert adjuvants that are often undisclosed and they're confidential. But these adjuvants include surfactants, which break down the, um, the surface tension, and cell penetrants that make the active ingredient penetrate the cells a lot easier. So it actually increases the toxicity by up to a thousand times. So you know, when they measure the, the safety issues, they're looking just at the active ingredient, but the formulation can be a thousand times more toxic. And when tests have been done on human placental cells and liver cells, they found that many formula formulations were hundreds of times more toxic than the active ingredient alone. And Roundup was 125 times more toxic than glyphosate alone on human placental and liver cells. So they do use um, the mixture toxicity to the advantage uh, when making toxic substances, but when you're um, trying to assess the effect on a human, it's very, very difficult. So toxic truth number six is that bioaccumulation happens over our lifespan. Now, fat-soluble toxicants, remember they're often they're the persistent organic pollutants, they're not excreted because fat is so valuable. So it accum they accumulate in our fatty tissue over our lifespan because it's much easier to take them in than to excrete them. And in fact, there's a, a theory that says that obesity epidemic is our body's uh, attempt to dilute these toxic chemicals. And there used to be a, well, there is a public health uh, principle that says that the solution to pollution is dilution. So if you can't get rid of something toxic, you can just dilute it. And in the past, we've diluted it in the oceans or diluted it in the atmosphere, and we're paying the price now because all the oceans and all the atmosphere is polluted. So within our body, if you can't get rid of a toxic substance, 
what you what you can do is trying to dilute it with more fat and the fattiest organ in your body is your brain so for the brain to reduce the toxic exposure what it does it puts on fat around your abdomen um, which then stores that toxic substances out of sort of harm's way and that's one of the theories for the global rise in obesity we also know that um, these Persistent pollutants, like fat soluble chemicals, are often carcinogenic. And as we get older, we're more prone to fat, um, fatty tissue cancers. So the you know, cancers such as breast cancer, prostate cancer, bone marrow cancer, uh, uh, happens as you get older. And this can be due to the, the accumulated load of toxic chemicals in our fat. And we also know that the body burden of, of toxicity is passed on to the next generation um, in utero. And that targets the, fe the fetal brain because the brain is the um, fattiest organ in a fetus. In a fetus, there's not much fat in a fetus. They don't have a fetus uh, doesn't have a lot of body fat. So any fat soluble chemical that comes through the placenta, and they do pass through the placenta, um, really directly targets the fetal brain. So when assessing uh, infants exposure or the fetal exposure uh, to toxic chemicals they've looked at uh, toxicity or toxic chemicals within umbilical cord blood and one one study by the environmental working group uh, looked, found a hundred or 287 um, toxicants in umbilical cord blood and of those 180 were known to be carcinogens 280 of them caused birth defects in animals and 217 were toxic to the nervous system and brain and in Canada, they actually published a report, a detailed report called Pre-Polluted, which describes how our infants are being born pre-polluted because of this in utero transfer of toxicity to the most vulnerable um, humans that there are, which is uh, the human fetuses. And then, so fetuses, you know, get exposed to, you know, concentrated toxicity, um, and that's the body's attempt to give them nourishment, to give them good fat, that these toxic chemicals come along for the ride with the good fat. And then when they're born, they're breastfed. And a study done in Victoria, where I live, in Australia, in the 1990s, found that the uh, dose of toxic DDT from breast milk was higher, uh, much greater than the acceptable daily intake for an adult. Um, it wasn't just DDT, it was a range of pesticides. So that, and when they look at the acceptable daily intake, that's, that's based on a 70 kilogram adult. But they found that human infants were getting more than that acceptable daily intake from their mother's breast milk because of this um, concentration of toxicity and the, um, the delivery of fat via breast milk. Or I do need to stress though that breast is still best. And um, you, just because of the toxicity issue, you know, there's no avoiding it, but um, there's so many other benefits from immune benefits and psychological benefits and, and bonding benefits and nutrient benefits that you know you don't want to avoid breast milk just because of that toxic load but it's just a sad state where you're trying to do the best for your infant and you're inadvertently toxifying them while you're detoxifying yourself so we've talked a bit about persistent organic pollutants there's also pseudo persistent pollutants um, and the persistent ones are the ones that are in fat that's hard to get rid of but there are some that that they can be excreted they're water soluble but we we keep on taking them in which means we're exposed to them all the time and that includes many endocrine disrupting chemicals which are ingested continually and um, things like uh, organophosphate pesticides which are the most commonly used pesticides now which are water soluble so you pee them out but if you're eating every day um, eating them every day you're exposing yourself all the time to them so things like bpa levels um, are also um, you know persistent and they're the ones you know nine, more than 90 percent of the american population were found to have bpa and higher bpa levels are associated with um, abnormal liver enzymes cardiovascular disease and diabetes so these are often called obesogens and toxic truth number seven is that windows of development are critical and that means when you're exposed can be just as important as what you're exposed to and the dose and the mixture. And an example of this is thalidomide, which in the 1970s was used for um, treating morning sickness. And 
you know, thalidomide can be a useful drug in adults, but if you're an infant, if you're a fetus exposed to thalidomide, you get fecomelia, which means your limb buds don't develop. Another example was looking at prenatal exposure to organophosphate pesticides. Remember, they're the most commonly used pesticides nowadays that are water soluble. Um, so they looked at exposure to organophosphate pesticides and phthalates. And they measured the level in the urine of pregnant mothers in the third trimester of pregnancy. And their level of um, organophosphates and phthalates actually correlated with the children's intellectual development later on in life, you know, age five or age seven. So, yeah, that exposure in that critical periods of development can actually have a lifelong effect. And we talked about how often these chemicals target infant brains. And there are a whole range of neurodevelopmental toxic toxicants. And this has been you know, well researched. And uh, two of the top researchers are Philip um, Grangin and Philip Land Landrigan, who have written about this in The Lancet um, on neurobehavioral effects of the developmental toxicity. And they, they state that the world is facing a silent pandemic of chemical brain drain with increasing rates of neurodevelopmental disabilities, including autism, ADHD, dyslexia, and other cognitive impairments. And when they looked at the known neurodevelopmental toxicants, there are obvious things like lead and mercury and PCBs, and arsenic, but things like fluoride and pesticides like chlorpyrifos and DDT, etc. And the PBDEs, which are fire retardants. So these all, all have um, neurodevelopmental toxicity that affects our next generation. And we know that early exposure leads to this latent chronic disease. Remember, I mentioned the phthalates and organophosphates exposure. So these endocrine disrupting effects are often irreversible and they may not be evident until later on in life. And uh, one example was organophosphate exposure during critical periods of development. So, you know, in utero can affect metabolic function and it, it actually fosters dietary choices. So it actually makes you crave high fat food and it, favours the development of metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and obesity. So these are often called obesogens. So we see these, the two boys in this photo here with a big can of, you know, big bottle of soda and a chocolate bar each. Um, well, they were probably programmed from birth to crave this food. And you, and you can say they're not their fault for just eating this, but it's not. This is endemic in society. It's, it's part of the whole structure, the fabric of our um, current society that we're programming our children to be obese, diabetic, um, and you know have lifelong chronic disease. So toxic, toxic truth number eight is that effects are epigenetic and transgenerational. And that means that they may not actually change the DNA, but they change how DNA is expressed, and that this changes, or these changes, can actually be passed down through multiple generations. Now that can be really obvious when you see a, a, a pregnant mother and she has a female fetus and that female fetus already has its ovum uh, um, that, that are there present. So any toxic exposure that mother is exposed to is actually affecting three generations. So it's affecting her, her child and her children's children. Now that, that is um, a direct toxic effect that can impact on three generations. Yet we also know that epigenetic changes can actually be passed on, not just through females, but through multiple generations. Um, and there's epigenetic inheritance. So epigenetic inheritance has been studied under the term environmental epigenetics. And this has created a whole new paradigm for evolution um, in a contaminated world. So for example, that they've done studies on ancestral exposure to endocrine disruptors, um, three generations previously, and they found that they influenced how adult male defendants were re responded to stress during their early, early adolescence. So these you know, teenage boys um, responded to stress differently depending on their grandparents' exposure to endocrine disruptors. And the epigenetic effects of these environmental contaminants are transforming evolutionary and not just physiological and ecological trajectories. So not isn't just affecting how we function and how wildlife function, it's actually affecting how they evolve. And so these effects, they're robust and they're observed at the levels of the transcriptome, which is 
um, the proteins that are made from um, DNA, but also morphology, which is the shape and the body type, the physiology, which is the function, and the metabolism of critical brain nuclei and behavior. So at all levels of uh, function, uh, we have these effects of endocrine disruption. And this was described in this book, Epigenetics and Human Health, which is starting to, just, you know, starting to document um, these incredible effects that can be lasting generations. And toxic truth number nine is exposure is unequal and unjust. And toxic exposure varies with public policy in terms of what's allowed and what's permitted, and often that's very loose. Um, on demographics, so your age, your socioeconomic status, your education, occupation. In fact, there's a study that, that can predict your um, socioeconomic status based on the toxicity you're exposed to. So if you're poor, you're much more likely to have industrial um, contaminants. If you're more wealthy, you're more likely to have things maybe like mercury because you're eating more sushi and fish. Um, so that can actually determine your toxicity. And it's not just one, you know, the rich have less toxicity, they just have different toxicity. But then your location or where you, where you live and your exposure to um, natural and environmental um, and you know, industrial uh, toxic agents. And then your consumption, what you eat and the products you use, the personal care products and the, 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 whether it's paints and other um, occupational products you might be using, can all affect uh, what you're exposed to and the mitigation measures so whether you use personal protective equipment and how you use products um, can all, will all affect your exposure now it's sad to say that catastrophic accidents happen at every stage of um, the production of, of industrial chemicals so for example um, we had the bp oil spill where where oil was being extracted from the ground we had the Exxon Valdez disaster where oil was being transported. We had the Bhopal disaster where a pesticide factory exploded um, when pesticides were being made. We had the Chernobyl and Fukushima disaster where they were just being used. And we have disasters like um, the Love Canal and um, areas like Cranbourne in Australia where they had whole suburbs built on industrial um, dumps and the toxic chemicals were in the ground and they actually started bubbling up and the, the level of um, cancers and um, stillbirths and fetal abnormalities were just way beyond um, acceptable um, because of the hazard waste disposal. disposal. And apparently there's more than 500,000 sites in Europe that humans just cannot go because of the toxicity um, induced by some of the, war, the wars, the First and Second World War, but also by um, you know, PCBs from power stations, etc. So we've actually contaminated you know, quite a big um, or quite many areas of the world uh, beyond where you know humans can even go because of the, that level of toxicity. Are you, are you depressed yet? Or well, hopefully not. So the, this last toxic truth that the risk is unequal and greatest for the young. So you know we talked a bit about how uh, the, you know, the fetus and the infant are taking the full brunt of the toxic exposures. But we also know that that you know, children are not just little adults. Children are, are quite different metabolically, physiologically. And compared to adults, children have higher food, fluid and air intake per kilogram. They also absorb more nutrients and more toxicity from the food that they eat. And they have a high metabolic rate, so they process it more. So they're actually, that metabolic rate make, means their exposure um, is greater because they're actually processing that more. Then children have immature immune systems and detoxification systems. So while they're absorbing more and extracting more and being exposed more, they're also less able to actually cope with it. They're less able to, to deal with that exposure. And you know, children spend more time near the ground and, and on the ground is where pesticides will, will settle, it's where dust will settle. And just like in the oceans where the microplastics absorb toxic chemicals and you know, get eaten, well, um, Dust attracts these toxic chemicals and then floats to the ground. So there's you know, um, lead and diesel exhaust and all these toxic agents in dust. So children, by crawling on the ground, um, are more exposed to that. And then children naturally um, you know, touch things and touch their face. And they, they need to do that. It builds their immune system. They're trying to sample the, the viruses and bacteria in their environment and teach their immune system about the, the microbe, microbial ecosystem. You know, remember the biome that's in their environment. 
that have children build their innate and um, acquired immune system. Yet, um, you know, while that, that can be good for children to be exposed to, to germs, it's actually really bad when they're exposed to toxic chemicals and um, you know, things like fire retardants that uh, are active in parts per billion you know, by touching the dust and touching their mouth, they're actually getting the, this extra toxic exposure. And then children also have a, a much longer time where they can develop illness. So they've, um, and if it takes 30 years to develop a cancer from toxic exposure, um, you know, adults may not experience that, but children will because they've got much longer um, time to, to see that toxic effect and all those mixture effects as well. When studying pesticide residues in Australian children, um, that actually hadn't been studied in a, lot, in a lot of places, they actually found that preschool children had widespread chronic exposure to multiple neurotoxic pesticide residues. And these are the organophosphate residues, which are um, in neurotoxic, they're based on um, you know, nerve gas. And that, you know, they affect the, the nervous system of insects. They also affect human nervous systems. Yet we don't really understand the full impact. And um, in Australia, the, the levels were higher than the levels in the US or Germany, but they're the only two other countries we actually have data. And we don't really have any data um, on the widespread exposure of the Australian population or other populations, because that's, that's unknown, it's unmonitored, and there's not a lot of incentive for um, you know, people to spend money. It's this expensive research to do. They, to detect these chemicals is not a trivial process, and I think governments don't really want to do it because they, then they have to act on it and regulate it, and um, you know, there's no pharmaceutical companies or other um, medical research um, agencies who want to spend a lot of money understanding this so you know really you know we don't know um you know the amount of that we don't know is actually enormous and that brings us back you know back to the first toxic truth that the, everyone's affected but the full extent is unknown so many questions remain you know what are the levels of the different toxicants in the so while the benefits of detoxification are still yet to be understood um, hazard reduction um, is pretty obvious and this whole course um, of extreme wellness is built around these five elements of um, toxicity but also an elimination. So has it, you know, toxicity comes into our body through our water, our food, our air, um, radiation, energy and matter and the products that we buy and build our buildings out of. And we excrete toxic agents through our bladder, our bowel, our breath, our body and our brain which controls our activity. So this is th the structure of this whole course and you know, there are five basic ways we can reduce um, these hazards. So one is we can avoid toxicity altogether. We can drink um, pure spring water. We can eat organic food. We can um, live in somewhere where there's clean air and reduce our exposure and uh, avoid um, electromagnetic radiation and toxic products, for example. So we can also block uh, the hazards from entering our body. So if you know, we have toxic water, we can get a water filter, we can get air, air filter, etc. We can transform, um, we can um, process the food to reduce the toxicity. If once it's into our body, we can assist our body to transform and detoxify. Um, so our liver is one of the major organs of detoxification. So we can support our liver function, which then conjugate um, toxic agents and help them get excreted. And then we can eliminate them. And then we eliminate them through our bladder, our bowel, our breath, our body and our brain. And then we can remove them from the environment altogether. So once they're out. So these are the basic principles of hazard reduction. Another really basic principle is the precautionary principle. And this is a principle to live by. And this, says, this is a principle that says, as your mother probably told you, it's better to be safe than sorry. So that's the idea that the action should be taken to prevent harm to the environment and to human health even if scientific evidence is inconclusive. And unfortunately, we don't often heed that, that um, advice. So this book here, The Precautionary Principle in the 21st Century, in the 20th century, um, it's also called Late Lessons from Early Warnings. And this provides examples of um, cases where we knew something was toxic decades before it became a devastating, catastrophic public health crisis. And this includes things like chlorofluorocarbons in the atmosphere, PCBs, um, you know, electrical transformers, um, spongy, um, bovine spongy form encephalopathy, which is a you know, mad cow disease. We knew about prions, 
before it was a problem diethyl stilbestrol which is the the drug that made the the rats either scrawny or um grotesquely obese um, at different doses but was also given to mothers and it caused ovarian cancer in their female offspring sulfur dioxide and antibiotics and growth promoters and asbestos were all known to be extremely toxic decades before the public health disasters um, that eventuated so you know sadly we don't always um, follow that precautionary principle but it is um, a really sound principle and you know, one to live you know hopefully you can live by that idea that it's much better to be safe than sorry and to avoid toxicity um, because once you're actually toxic it can be much harder to then deal with it so it's one idea is it's good to avoid toxicity but um, it can be very difficult and when i was you know looking at you know the, the five elements of our life our water our food our air our activities and our buildings um, I, I started to document the uh, toxic products that were in these um, in, in our environments and came up and it came up surprisingly and i've you know quantified the m amount of money that's spent on each of these industries so for example in our water um, you know, we have petrochemicals, we have plastic um, water bottles, we have chlorine and fluoride that all contaminate our water supplies. In our food, we have fertilizers, pesticides, GMOs, and processed food with additives and preservatives and colorings, etc., um, that make our food toxic. In our air, we have tobacco and transport emissions and nuclear radiation and electromagnetic radiation from 2G, 3G, 4G, now 5G. Um, our activities made toxic by the, through the media with. Um, propaganda and targeted ad campaigns and censorship um, for education now education can be the most powerful health intervention there is to lift people out of poverty and, and make um, people healthier but when education is institutionalized and um, you're made to conform and you know, not question authority then education itself can be a, um, quite a toxic input into your life and we have the pharmaceutical industry with vaccines and, and pharmaceutical drugs which are incredibly toxic. In fact, um, the, the correct use of pharmaceutical drugs is considered the third uh, largest cause of death in the United States. It's iatrogenic disease, doctor-caused disease. So the, the, the current you know, medical industry, the sort of healthcare industry, which is really disease care or illness care industry, is incredibly toxic. And then we have what's called fast-moving consumer goods, uh, which are you know, throwaway disposable things that have, you know, plastics and microplastics and nanoparticles and a whole range of um, industrial chemicals in these fast-moving consumer goods which are incredibly toxic and then the if we look at our buildings and our homes well one they're all um, based on debt and debt is actually toxic to our psyche and to our livelihoods and then the materials we build that build our homes out of you know from lead in their paint and asbestos and particle board and you know what they call McDonald's for mold which is all the you know the um, the chipboard etc and then you know, everything saturated with fire t retardants and then we're building weapons and that includes conventional weapons and nuclear weapons and, and biological weapons we're all incredible incredibly toxic to you know human health and and, and all life on earth and if you add that if you total the amount of money we spend on these products we total 61 trillion dollars which is more than two-thirds of global GDP so this is something we really we need to change um, that you know we're spending two-thirds on the global GDP on products that directly kill us and you know these uh, products are produced by just five industries so it's um, the big banks the agribusiness agri the oil energy industry the media and pharmaceutical industry really produce these five toxic products and you know, that's something we really do need to transform and when we think about the, the five major industries um, they're controlled by a very very small number of people so we have you know all the world's money food energy information and medicine is controlled by the banks ag agribusiness oil media and big pharma um, yet the, the people that control these industries is very very few in um, January 2019, it was estimated that the 26 richest people on Earth owned more than the poorest 50% of the world's population. And that was down from, I think, the 61 um, richest people in 2016 owned the same as the half the world. 
and in 2017 it was the top 43 richest people owned half the world now it's that as of 2019 the start of 2019 it was the top 26 richest people owned half the world and i don't know the most recent statistics but um it's been reported that in the first month of the lockdown in the pandemic in 2020 the billionaires in the, in the united states added 300 billion dollars to their wealth so the top three richest people in the us um, bill gates warren buffett and jeff bezos own as much as half the us population so this is a situation we have very few people controlling our wealth of the you know, our money our food our energy our information and our medicines and this is i think the, the challenge of the modern area is actually to um, have equal, you know, even distribution, you know, reduce that wealth inequality. But at the moment, you know, our the wealth and the control of the whole world is being concentrated into fewer and fewer people, and that's a real problem. So at the, you know, here, here's a you know, sort of a graphic that shows you know just a few people in our media, our banks, our agri agriculture, our oil and pharmaceuticals. Yet, you know, I think it's possible to change that. I think we, we really do have the ability to alter that. So the media, which is based on propaganda and censorship and, um, you know, different agendas, can be transformed to respect um, privacy and to respect net neutrality. Our banks can be transformed to respect, to create a collaborative economy and peer-to-peer -peer, um, distributed um, network you know which can be based on cryptocurrency so we don't need big central banks we can have a distributed um, distributed and decentralized economy the agribusiness industry that's controlling all our food can be transformed to become regenerative agriculture which can very rapidly um, reverse climate change and produce seasonal local organic food for everyone on earth the oil industry fossil fuel industry can be transformed into renewable energies um, and providing clean energy for everyone and the pharmaceutical industry could be transformed to focus on wellness and transform to become a wellness industry. And then we'll, we'll see that we're living in a totally different universe. Now, it's not that the, the, those five industries that are controlling us now are evil or bad. We've paid them, we've needed them to get to where we are now, which is um, a globally connected planet. But right now, um, you know, we're at the point where we don't need them anymore. We have to transform away from them. They've come to the end of their useful life. So here's a, a little infographic that is sort of giving you a, an idea that we need to let go of these, pro the, what I call the products of death, those five major industries. But we need to thank these industries that have boosted us to become a globally connected world. But then just like booster rockets sending you know, uh, the command module out into space, you know, our consciousness, the human consciousness is the command module. And these industries um, are like the booster rockets. And just like booster rockets, which are, you know, noisy and smelly and toxic and leave this toxic plume behind them, you know, they're needed to get the, the command module, you know, up into the, you know, beyond the gravity of the earth. But then they need to be jettisoned and we can co then continue to evolve. So we need to thank these industries for getting us to where we are, a globally connected planet. You know, now we have, you know, everyone's got smartphones and everyone can talk to everyone else. Um, but you know, we need to let go of these industries. They can crash and burn and fall back to earth. And then consciousness, human consciousness can then continue to evolve on a totally different infrastructure, which I've just described of you know, regenerative agriculture and renewable energy and the wellness industry and net neutrality and collaborative peer-to-peer -peer economy, et cetera. So that's where we're going now. We, we need to move from toxicity and fear to wellness and love. And hopefully in this course, you're gonna get some tools that you can um, not just be part of that process, for your own life, but by you adopting that, you know, that attitude and these principles, you will then become an active agent in conscious evolution. And everyone alive right now is part of this evolution in consciousness. And whether you respond to fear or you respond to love, that will really determine the trajectory of the whole world. So you, know, you really do have an active role to play in human evolution. So we're looking at the 10 toxic truths, um, I'm going to correlate them with what I call the five healthy habits. So for every um, you know, negative thought, there's an equally valid and equally powerful positive thought. So while we talked about these 10 toxic truths, 
there, there are, and I've actually paired them. So they've, you know, put them into you know, groups of five, which I love to do, as you know. So the fact that everyone is affected and the full extent is unknown can be counted by being positive and knowing that nature has infinite healing power. No matter how toxic the world is and um, how, how much we're affected, nature has the ability to heal and that, that ability is infinite. And the fact that tiny doses have um, big effects and those effects are magnified up the food chain, we can counter that by choosing wisely, by consuming low and slow, which means seasonal, local, organic and whole, and low on the processing chain. So we can actually reduce our um, exposure by our choices. The fact that timing is critical and effects are long lasting, well, you know, to know that you're affected by the toxicity of your grandmother and um, your toxicity will affect your grandchildren can be devastating, but the best thing you can do that is to actually feel connected in the moment and come to your senses and experience the power of now and be fully present in the moment and know that what you're doing in this moment is the best thing you can do to counter the effects that um, the ancestral effects of your you know, parents and grandparents and what you're doing now is the best possible thing you can do for your children and then you don't have to worry about it. The fact that cocktails accumulate over our lifespan um, you can counter that by moving clearly, by opening up your channels of elimination, by opening, you know, keeping your, your bladder, your bowel, your breath, your body and your brain open and flowing. And the fact that exposures and risks are unequal and unjust, you can counter that by growing your own gifts, grounding your life in positive action. So make your whole life um, uh, uh, a life of activism, a life of positive action, and knowing that you're doing the best possible thing for yourself and future generations, you can actually consider yourself a superhero. You're changing the world. You can help save the world, and that can fill your life with meaning and joy, and you can actually live a fulfilled life knowing you're, actually, you're an active agent for positive change in the world. And hopefully this is the, the, um, the, the feeling, and the, I'm going to give you some, a whole lot of practical tips you can do to actually enable you to do that within your life. So you can live happy, well, long, and feel empowered and fulfilled. And what you know, where attention goes, energy flows. So let's imagine a world of wellness. Let's put our attention not on the negativity. We understand the negativity, but let's focus on positivity. Let's imagine a world of wellness. What does that look like? What does it look like for you? What does it look like for you when two thirds of the world's money gets freed up from toxic products and gets used for um, products that enhance our health and well-being. So there's some of the issues we can explore in this course. And hopefully this will give you a, a perspective that you can actually take through your whole life and you know, understand the negative, but then act from the positive.